Have you ever wondered why most of the videos and photos that you've ever tried to take underwater appear to be blue and hazy? Well, it's because water is basically like a light filter, absorbing the red part of the visible spectrum, only leaving behind bluish light for us to see. And that's if we're lucky. In fact, most of the ocean is completely dark. Beyond a couple of hundred meters, there's almost no light at all. So any robot taking photos underwater needs to carry its own light source. This is an underwater robot. No, it's not. This is an underwater Boston Terrier named Rocco. I just thought it was a great picture. But this is an underwater robot. This is Sirius, a completely autonomous, bottom-following robot that takes high-resolution stereo images of the seafloor. It takes two images per second and uses high-powered strobes to illuminate the scene. Working underwater is a challenging domain, not just because it's light-limited, but because there are many engineering and technical challenges too. For starters, there's no GPS underwater, so knowing where you are is not necessarily straightforward. This is an example of a robotic survey completed in Tasmania. It spans multiple kilometers and hours. Given the lack of GPS, the robot is fitted with a number of sensors to help estimate its position. But we actually rely on the images to help improve the navigation. The lines show the robot's track. You can see that the robot has moved in straight lines and then zigzagged back over itself. Its estimate of where it thinks it is usually drifts a bit over time, so we employ a method called Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, or SLAM, to look for landmarks in the images that have been seen previously. When the algorithm recognizes something in the images, it then snaps the current location back to the correct position and updates the nav estimates. This then gets propagated back through all the other poses to improve the navigation. So as you can see, images are quite an important part of this whole process. However, the raw images that are collected look like this. Light limited, not very much to see. Applying some contrast stretching and changing the color balance certainly helps, allowing us to make images that are more accurate and true to reality. But there's still problems. Things that are close to the camera appear bright and red, and things that are further away still appear blue, green, and dark. Our robot has two cameras and collects overlapping stereo images. Those overlapping stereo pairs make it possible to triangulate key points in the images to resolve 3D structure. Then, using the 3D structure of the scene, we can feed that into a light attenuation model to significantly improve the appearance of the image. Comparing the corrected image to the naively corrected one, um, we can see that incorporating the 3D structure makes regions in the image that are both far away and close to the camera much more consistently colored and illuminated than the simple contrast correction. This then allows us to generate large-scale photorealistic 3D reconstructions with consistent color and lighting. On the left you can see the naively corrected images, while on the right you can see the mosaic that's created using images corrected while accounting for 3D structure. So now you might be asking, why is any of this relevant and what are the applications? Well, our robot at the Australian Centre for Field Robotics forms the Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Node of the Integrated Marine Observing System, or IMOS. IMOS is a large-scale national project worth hundreds of millions of dollars and set up for monitoring the oceans around Australia. This map shows the images that have been collected by our robot Sirius at various sites, most of which have been revisited every year. We have millions of images coming in at a rapid rate but hard drives full of images are not really all that useful. And so the images need to be interpreted in order to extract quantitative information. And this is normally an arduous and manual process, Exhibit A. And so a big area of active research in our lab is using machine learning and computer vision to help streamline this, Exhibit B. And here's a quick example of that. So scientists typically label 50 random pixels in a small subset of the images, let's say one in every 100 images. We can then take those labeled pixels and train a computer algorithm to learn a pattern in the labels. 
This makes it possible to extrapolate those few random pixels in less than 1% of the images into classified results for all the pixels in all the images in the survey. The colors here show different class labels. If we look at those two of those classes in more detail, kelp and sand, we can see that below a depth range of 60 meters, we don't really see any kelp, but instead this depth is dominated by sand. This is an example of how light not only affects how the images look, but also what we find in the images. Another example of how light impacts on what we see in the images down there is a survey that we did off the coast of Tassie to look for sea urchins. We surveyed an area that used to be a lush kelp forest that has now been gobbled up by sea urchins. This is known as an urchin barren. When we sent the robot down there to survey the site during the day, sure enough it did look pretty barren, but there didn't appear to be any sea urchins. When we sent the robot down at night, just a few hours later, lo and behold, it was still barren, but there were plenty of urchins visible. The nice thing about using a robot is that we can easily and reliably survey the same area at different times, day or night, and even across multiple years. Something that's quite difficult to do repeatedly using any other survey tool. Here you can see the same patch of the boulder field looking pretty different during the day and at night. So you might remember Cyclone Ita that moved through the central co moved through the coast of northern Queensland in Australia in 2014 and devastated a famous resort on Lizard Island in the Great Barrier Reef. Well, the cyclone didn't just devastate the resort. It also had a significant impact on many of the coral reefs around the area. We went there soon after the cyclone to assess the damage. However, instead of taking the robot this time, which requires substantial infrastructure to operate, we took our diver rig, which is basically just the stereo camera off the robot strapped up in a package that a human can swim around with. But humans are nowhere near as good as robots at swimming in straight lines and ensuring consistent coverage. So we had to rig up a line and a pole and swim around in a spiral pattern to constrain our motion. Using this method, we surveyed 22 sites around the island. Here are six examples of the reef records that were collected. Each of these spans about a 14 meter diameter, consists of a couple of thousand images, and covers 150-ish square meters. In addition to the photorealistic 3D reconstructions, we can also look at the 3D structure of these sites. This allows us to make quantitative assessments of the structural complexity of these areas and see how they change in response to these catastrophic disturbances. So we've actually been all over the world with our vehicles, and we've used them for things other than marine biology and ecology. Here we went to survey an ancient submerged city of Pavla Petri in Greece, one of the oldest known archaeological sites. The city was sunk over 3,000 years ago, with artifacts dating back as much as 5,000 years. It was discovered in the 1960s, and since then, archaeologists have been progressively building up a map of the town. This image shows the city map that's been the result of decades of mapping and in situ measuring using traditional techniques. In 2011, we brought our small robot named Ivor onto the scene. The blue lines on the figure on the right show what we surveyed in the same area. It covers the full area of the archaeological map. However, the robot did that in just three days. When we compare the results, this shows a zoomed in portion of the map generated using traditional measurement techniques, showing a house with rooms and structures. And then this shows the photo mosaic of the same area surveyed using a stereo imaging system. When we look at the 3D depth map, we can see outlines of walls and structures. And when we overlay the archaeological map, we can see that it agrees quite well. So these results show that it's possible to create these maps after the fact without spending countless hours manually measuring things out in the field. In fact, this field trip was actually the subject of a BBC documentary where filmmakers and archaeologists used 3D reconstructions that were generated using these stereo mapping methods as a foundation on which to virtually recreate the ancient city. 
I hope that helps to shed some light on what we've been up to at the Underwater Group at the Australian Centre for Field Robotics. Thank you very much for listening.